and engage us in a dialogue with recommendations of how we should proceed beyond receipt of this document. What are the implications for us going forward? We're going to have a new mayor in the city. What are we going to demand of the prospective candidates right now? We need to know that they're willing, that if they want to be mayor, they're willing to uh, adopt these 88 points especially one of particular point uh, um, such as the um, police when they're involved in uh, uh, officer involved shootings of civilians. Right now, the individuals that oversee that, and I know Kelvin Anderson will talk more about this when he makes his comment, right now the police police themselves. And what we're saying that we know that you agree, and if you do, please let it be known, that it's time for citizens to be represented on that panel so that it's more balanced, that it's not just police um, representing themselves. And also, if you look at the documents on the side, and people that got here early got an opportunity to look at those documents, and we took a snapshot of a specific period of 2012 to 2013, uh, because we wanted to make certain that people uh, looking at the snapshot would actually see that it's during the period of time that Commissioner Ramsey is in fact a commissioner. And when you look at those documents that are taped on the table, you actually see with all the different police involved shootings, Mike, that none of the police officers were arrested. The DA, when you look under the column of the DA, and that starts with Lynn Abraham into the current DA, it says dismiss are not scheduled, decline, so you can get away with killing citizens and nothing's going to happen to you. If we happen to get you as far as getting you arrested, they go before an arbitration panel, which we've held demonstrations in front of the arbitrator's building down on Locust Street, I think it's Walnut, Port of Walnut, somewhere over there, and was successful in letting them know that the citizens disagree with the fact that they were not going to arrest the police officer, that they were basically going to get away with murder. The number of police officers that have been involved, most of the time it's the same ones, and they're still getting paid, and they're still killing folks. So at this time, I'm going to turn the uh, program over to the Chief Counsel for Man, Vivian Crawford, and then we will hear from the panel. The, the structure tonight is each one of the panelists will give an opening statement, and then we're going to hear from you. Thank you. So I suppose I need to stand also. Um, as um, Sister Paula indicated, when you read the justice report, and Commissioner Ramsey has sort of taken credit for it, and the Justice Department has gone along with it, that in fact, they came to the city of Philadelphia as a result of Commissioner Ramsey requesting them. So I am, in light of the fact that we got ministers on the in the room. I'm going to be very nice with what I say. I'm going to clean it up. The young people say H to the no. That is exactly what it is. Because, as Sister Paula mentioned, on June 9, 2008, Philadelphia NAM took 17 cases that were egregious cases of citizens being shot by the Philadelphia Police Department. That was June 9th 2008, 17 cases. October 2008, the Department of Justice said to Philly Nan after many requests, and this is the Department of Justice that was under the, at the Bush administration, and they said to Philadelphia Nan, well, you know, there's going to be a new administration, you're sort of lame duck, there's going to be a new administration, and uh, this guy, Barack Obama, is probably going to be president. And so you should wait until that administration comes in place for, to expect some action because at this point we're just cleaning up our files and getting out of here. Now, uh, in November of 2008, we all know what happened, President Barack Obama was elected. In May, May 12, 2009, so we actually waited after the election of President Obama. And he was inaugurated in January. In May 12, 2009, we personally hand-delivered 23 cases to the Department of Justice. We went to the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. We stood in the lobby for two hours waiting for someone to come downstairs to receive the report from us. Fortunately, 
the U.S. Marshal that was there after, watch, after watching us there and engaging us in conversation, one woman took it upon herself to say, I'm going to hand deliver this to the head of the department so that you will, so that they, they cannot say that they did not get it. Now, while we were standing there, we got into a conversation with them, and one of the things that they said to us, they sort of chuckled when they realized what we were there about, is, well, guess what? We got rid of Ramsey. So we, we, we wished him off Philadelphia. We just wanted him away from here. Now, uh, that was May 12, 2009. As we were driving back from D.C., and I should tell you that we were accompanied by two police officers. Two female, two Philadelphia police officers were with us. As we were coming back, their phones started to the use the kids' expression, blow up. Because in response to us being there, several police officers were, there was a, there was a, a there was a problem because they had been involved in theft. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like they were to throw us a bone so they get these police officers that they had been investigating about theft, that makes the press and somehow they thought we were going to be happy with that. Now that was May 12, 2009. June 7, 2009, we held a hearing at a public forum at the uh, African American Historical Museum. Michael was there on the panel. You know, we were there all day long. We took testimony from citizens. At that point, it was most alarming to me because not only were we talking about men being shot, we were also talking about women who were attacked and beaten up by police. Sometimes for just sitting on their porch. Now, what I also want to say to you is that testimony, and it's recorded, we have it, we have it documented. But what we learned from that was a complaint that became consistent throughout the day. And Michael, you will remember this, that they started talking about the boot cops. The boot cops. We kept hearing people talk about the boot cops. Now, when uh, Governor Rendell, well, when Ed Rendell was governor, mm -hmm. he, um, in trying to say he was helping the city of Philadelphia with mm -hmm. our crime problem, ordered that the state police would be on the expressways. Do you remember when the expressways were patrolled by police officers that their number began with an X? They were, they were specifically for patrolling the expressways. Now you notice it's the state police. So, the, so that what happened is that his, the theory was that those highway patrol officers would be free to assist with the duties of regular policing and the state would take care of the highways. What happened with those highway patrol officers, they didn't have community-based experience. Now, I happen to get, uh, have as a client someone who was attacked by the highway patrol. This is how I learned about the boot cops, because I had been hearing and I heard it at, the, at, at our meeting, and it turned out I ended up with a case of someone who was beaten by, the, by them. They are not assigned to a district. So they operate, they roam the cities, and they operate really not under any sort of governance. There isn't really anyone watching the boot cops, the highway patrol. And during that day that we were listening to testimony, we heard so many people complaining about the same issue, and that's the boot cops. Okay, so um, that was June 7th, 2009. Now, those of you that know me know I'm an activist. I've been involved in a lot of things, and I was very much involved in an organization, a progressive organization. But when none of those white progressives showed up mm -hmm. for our hearing, I left those organizations. Right. So, because I felt that this was an issue that was a major concern. And since we were busy supporting their efforts, it seemed to me mm -hmm. that police misconduct is something that I've been mm -hmm. fighting all of my life. Right down the street, Gerard College, I marched at Gerard College. I was at trailways laying in front of buses to get black bus drivers. <laughs> so that, with Cecil, so we do know that back at that time, Cecil was complaining about police brutality. This is not new. Now, the reason I give you that background is because we had the hearing June 7, 2009, and Nan was very active in continuing to pursue what's going to happen in Philadelphia. Now, in 2010, Paula, Chairman Peebles, was told that the, gut, that the uh, Department of Justice was not going to intervene because on direct 
orders from a, an elected representative who was the governor at the time that the Department of Justice needed to stand down because it would be embarrassing to him to pursue anything about the Philadelphia police. Mm -hmm. Now, you can figure out who was, the, who was the governor at that time. It wasn't Corbin. Do I need to lead you anyplace okay. else? Okay. So that I uh, told to stand down. That's exactly what happened. Now, during the Corbin administration, there was absolutely nothing done on this issue. So in 2013, uh, we asked, Philly Nan asked our national president to intervene. Our national president is Reverend Al Sharpton. We don't know what Reverend Sharpton did, but we certainly do know as a result of it in 2014, the Department of Justice finally decided to come into Philadelphia about the police misconduct. And if you'll remember, there was a hearing in July, uh, last July 2014, and at that time, they thought it was going to be a nice, calm hearing, and we pretty much turned that out when we started expressing to them how long-standing this complaint had been and that no one had done anything about it, and no one had specifically addressed the 23 cases that we had hand-delivered to them. So I, in my dramatic fashion, decided that here, since your mail isn't working, and since you all had a problem, this might have gotten shredded, we're going to re-present you with those cases. And since that time, we've had a couple of meetings with the Department of Justice, and the result of it is this report. So I'm giving you that background because I want everybody to be clear. The Department of Justice did not come here because Commissioner Ramsey asked them to come in. The Department of Justice came to Philadelphia because Philadelphia name was very proactive in trying to get this done. But I want you to also understand as if, you know, I look at the audience, what you need to understand is we've been, Philadelphia Nan has been fighting this battle since 2008. Nothing happened, it's been seven years. And now we have this document, and now we have the inquirer, which I was, I was quite pleased to see this seven years late, but addressing the issue. So I, it's, a, it's always a long battle when you're fighting like this, it takes a long time, it takes a lot of effort, and it's just consistency, and that's what Philly Nan has been. So with that, I just wanted to give you a timeline so that if anybody's confused, or maybe the next time you see Commissioner Ramsey, if you can pull out a calendar, maybe he's confused, and somebody can straighten him out, because he didn't ask them to come here. When he found out that they were coming, mm -hmm. then he jumped on the bandwagon. And aren't we used to that in this struggle? Well, Nothing mm -hmm. new about that. Yeah. Okay, so I don't want anybody to walk out of this room misled, thinking that the Department of Justice came here because Commissioner Ramsey wanted to do the right thing. Because he didn't want to do the right thing. And this has been an ongoing problem in the city of Philadelphia for years. But most assuredly, Philly Nan got involved with delivering materials to get an investigation years ago, 2008. So now we can proceed with the form, but is everybody clear? Yes. Who asked the Department of Justice to come here? Yeah. And who did not? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief Counsel Crawford. Yes, ma'am. Oh, this is Sundays. I'm sorry, this is the Sunday inquiry. This, 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 this past Sunday. This past Sunday. Oh, we got it. Okay. okay. The governor did not want the Philadelphia to be embarrassed right now. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Vivian. We're going to move right along. At this time, we're going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves. Well, we don't want to do that. I'll do it. I got it. <laughs> I got it. Because I always get upset when somebody says, tell me about yourself. Okay. okay. Uh, so, so we're going to start. Uh, I, you know, somebody, as to my estimation, does not need an introduction. Is and Seated next to uh, Chairman Peebles is my dear friend, the activist attorney. I'm so happy that that he's a part of what is going on, and that is uh, Michael Cord, and I'm Michael Cord Esquire, and the organization that Michael has put together, and I asked you all to support these organizations because these folks are working hard, is Avenging, Avenging the Ancestors Coalition. So Michael, it's my brother, whenever there's a stroll, I know you're going to be there. 
and I so much appreciate seeing you. And Michael and I sort of know when there's something going on, we, we look around because we know the other one is there. So Mr. Michael Corden, I know, I'm pretty sure you all do listen to him, and you know who he is, and he's somebody that we need to support. So Michael. Yes, he is. <laughs> okay, and seated next to Michael is Reverend Holston, Reverend Greg Holston, and I had to ask him for this. The name of his organization is Power. Isn't that a wonderful name, yeah. Power? Yeah. Okay, and, and Power stands for Philadelphians Organized to Witness and Empower. Wait a minute. To, to, to witness. You can, you can you close and take out the end. Take out the first end. Philadelphians Organized to Witness, Empower, and Rebuild. I'm so sorry. My handwriting is bad. I can't even read my own handwriting. So, thank you and welcome Reverend Holston. Now, seated next to the Reverend Holston, I keep saying that I want to make sure that we're all clear that we need to support these brothers because they're doing things. And all of them, all of these organizations are needed. And we're all working towards a common purpose. So seated next to him is uh, Mr. Kelvin Anderson, who is the executive director of the Philadelphia Police Advisory Board. Why is that important? Because, and we need to do whatever we can do to strengthen his yes, yes. authority, right. because this is the brother that's taking care of looking at what the police department is doing and needs to have as much access as possible to do his job. So we are grateful for your input, and we know what a hot seat you sit in. So that being said, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that being said, now Chairman Peoples will call on everyone, but at least now you know who they are. Okay, right. not that you didn't, but now you know. Thank okay. you. And what I'm going to do is just make one announcement. We're going to hear from Michael, then we're going to hear from Reverend Halston, and we're going to hear from Kevin, Calvin, and then we're going to open up the floor to each of you. You are while there making their opening statements. Again, I will invite you to look at the recommendations so we can engage in this dialogue. I want to also uh, recognize a representative from the Human Relations Commission that's here this evening. Can you give us your name again? Thank you. And we're glad to have someone here. Um, is there anyone else that have a, a particular purpose outside of being a regular citizen? How about you, sir? Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a colleague and friend of Mike Palmer's and a candidate for judge. Oh, well, I was just endorsed by Mike oh, yeah. last time around in 2013. So I'm in the criminal courts uh, defending a lot of these type cases. And uh, Michael knows, and I'm here because I'm interested. Thank you. Vince, good to have you. But those of you who know Leon, because Leon has a Leon has a newsletter that goes out, and we encourage you to read that. But when we talk about, I mean, I, I, I like to say to people, when we talk about activist attorneys, anybody calls me, I refer, I say, Michael, Leon, and me. I don't know anybody else that, that, that you folk are coming to, and, and, and uh, I have this happen all the time, coming to with, with the sob stories, and we try to help you, and sometimes it hurts us trying to help other people, but that's another story. But what I do want you to appreciate is that you're going to see, when you see faces all the time, you're going to see Michael, you're going to see Lon, you're going to see us wherever there's a problem, because that's just who we are and what we do. So, and, and before Michael begins, um, we have another person here that's running for office, Ms. Gordon. Tracy yeah. Gordon. Yeah. So, She's running for commissioner. Tracy is running for city commissioner, and I didn't get your last name, sir. My name is Mr. Cassini. I'm more Susan. here because, uh, first of all, I respect the three attorneys that are here, and of course the other members, yeah. and know what they've been doing more than my candidacy. I'm here for that reason. Vince Giussini is my name. Yes, but, but at the same time, I always like to be, whoever shows up, you know, when you go in that ballot box, you got to remember, and I tell people that voting for judges is very important because you don't have a conversation with the mayor. You probably don't have a conversation with your city council person. But some of you 
doesn't have to be criminal, it could be civil. You will have an interaction with the judge, so you need to make certain that, that the judicial candidates are concerned about your issues are those candidates that you pull the lever for. And Tracy Gordon is fighting for the rights to make certain everybody is able to vote. So yes. Tracy, yes. Tracy Gordon, I appreciate mm -hmm. you. She's one of our commissioners, and we need to support you. Mike, the mic is yours. <laughs> um, actually, well, I'm pleased, uh, first of all, to be invited to be here, and um, I'm glad that a few more people showed up mm -hmm. and who were here at the outset, but I'm never disillusioned by low turnout because every major revolutionary movement has always started out with the enlightened few. And we also have to remember that the people that are most beaten down by the system they're trying to pay their bills. Yes. They don't really have time to come to these fancy meetings and gatherings and protests. We lawyers and activists and others, we can do that, but when you gotta take care of kids and got two jobs and minimum wage, it's kinda hard to come out. That's why it's really incumbent upon us to do what we're doing. That's so right. when we come out and there's not a thousand people around, it's not standing room only, we should not be disappointed. We should be energized to know that we have that much more work to do. That's right. um, so I'm glad to be here. I'm going to spend more time listening tonight than talking uh, because I want to hear from the community. One of the things I do want to suggest that people do, I write a weekly column for Philadelphia Magazine. And back in 2012, I wrote an article about police brutality, police corruption, police misconduct. But more than just that, I talked about how untouchable the police are. People often complain to me, Mike, every time a cop does something wrong, you're yelling and screaming and protesting, but when young blacks kill other young blacks, you don't say anything. And they talk about this whole notion of black on black crime. Well, first of all, there's no such thing as a black on black crime. When whites kill whites, they don't call it white on white. When Latinos kill Latinos, they don't call it brown on brown. That's when right. Asians kill Asians, they don't call it yellow on yellow. It's no such thing as that black on black or any other ethnic on ethnic. It's a neighbor thing. People tend to attack those who live around them. It's as simple as that. Having said that, the reason why I don't spend much energy condemning young black men for killing young black men is because the system is going to condemn them for me. You know, when Raheem and Jamal and Tyrone commit crimes, the system comes down hard on them, they arrest them, they prosecute them, they jail them, and in many cases execute them. But when Officer O'Reilly kill somebody in the hood, nobody does anything. Right. So I'm here to yell and scream against the killers who get away. When I say killers who get away, I literally mean that. When you get a badge and a gun and a uniform in Philadelphia and got the country, you literally have a license to kill. A license to kill, think about that. So we need to make sure, there's a saying that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Where cops literally have absolute power. I started, and I'm only going to talk for maybe two more minutes because I really want to hear more from the panelists and other folks. But I would encourage people to read this article I wrote for Philadelphia Magazine. You can get it by simply going to thephillypost.com cord police. Thephillypost.com cord police. And it pretty much talks about the Police Advisory Commission. It talks about internal affairs, it talks about all of that. And it sings the praises of the Police Advisory Commission for doing all that it possibly could do. But the system was designed such that when the Police Advisory Commission, and certainly Director Anderson does a great job, but it requires him to go into the lion's den with both hands tied behind his back and to fight the lion. And he does all he can, biting the lion, kicking the lion, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but he still got his hands tied behind his back. So we need to make sure we come up with something to give him and the Police Advisory Commission more power. So if you read this article I wrote, you'll see about some of the egregious cases. Let me just spend a minute more talking mm -hmm. about this. I go into background talking about the history of racism in the police department. People would be surprised to know that it wasn't until the mid-50s, late 50s, that black police officers were permitted not only to drive police cars, but to sit in police cars. Think about that. In fact, a guy by the name of James Reeves, who became the first black commissioner in the police, uh, first black captain in the police department, talked about how black cops couldn't drive police cars and they couldn't even sit in police cars. What does that tell you? That tells you that what's going on now with racism in the police department is nothing new. Then let's fast forward to 1979. 1979, the Philadelphia Police Department became the first, I repeat, the first police department in the country to be prosecuted by the Justice Department. I'm talking about Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm not talking about Georgia. 
I'm not talking about Alabama, North Carolina, I'm talking about Philadelphia. Why is that? Because the Justice Department said in 1979, the police department in Philadelphia has, quote, widespread and severe acts of police brutality. And we all know about the beating of Delta Africa mm -hmm. on videotape. We know what Paul was talking about that was broadcast on Fox News. We know about the Five Squad in the 1980s. We know about the dropping of the bomb on the Moo family and the Philadelphia community. So what can we do about it is the question. The answer is we need to organize and support groups like NAN when they do something like this. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to go out and do your own thing. You can support groups like NAN that's already doing its thing. And the final thing I'll say in my last 37 seconds is this. I have maybe 10 copies of this. I put together something called the 10 Point Platform and Program to End and Criminalize Police Brutality. And I got this from the Black Panther Party 10-point program. Mm. I pretty much looked at their 10-point program and saw that it wasn't designed to destroy America and to engage in violence. It was designed to bring up people who are oppressed, black people, Latino people, white people. In fact, the whole school lunch program and breakfast program came from the Black Panther Party. So I took their 10-point program and came up with 10 points to end and criminalize police brutality. And I'm going to quickly go through them, just summarizing them. Number one says agitate. In other words, participate in stuff like this. Number two, demand and elect statewide prosecutors. That's really important. There should be somebody on the state level whose sole responsibility it is to prosecute bad cops because DAs can't do it. Because the DA would prosecute Officer Smith today and got to use him as a witness in the case tomorrow. So it's not going to work. Number two, pressure the mayor and city council. This is very important. And um, Director Anderson can tell you more about it. Pressure the mayor and city council to abolish or amend the police advisory system. That's the problem right there. The Police Advisory Commission, they can see cops on videotape committing these egregious crimes and not only give them their jobs back, but give them payments for the time that they were suspended. Right. I'm not a big fan of Commissioner Ramsey, but he's been trying to do some stuff, and i got to right. give him credit for the some stuff he's tried to do, and when he tries to do it, the Arbitration Commission puts these cops right back yeah. on the job. And, and that's because the FOP put together, I won't even say they forced the city to accept this deal, but the city for some reason accepted the deal that was constructed by the FOP. And this deal, it's like a worker management contract where they have an agreement. And the city signed on to that. Well, the city's got to say that that contract they signed, that arbitration agreement, doesn't work. Number four, this is important, demand enhanced psychological evaluations for police recruits. Right. I don't know, but I've done an informal study, and many cops, not, I don't even know if it's most, were bullied in school. Were bullied in school. Mm -hmm. So it's payback time now for many of these guys, because I know some guys who were corny and nerds in yes, high school. Yes. All of a sudden now, you know, they just, I don't know, anyway. So we just need to demand enhanced psychological evaluations quickly. Number five, this is really important, and it's going to have to be a state law change make police officers personally liable to pay civil judgments. Because if I'm a cop and I illegally kill somebody, and for whatever reason the DAs don't prosecute me, but a civil lawyer comes in and files a wrongful death lawsuit, they might win a billion dollars. But I, as the cop, don't pay a dime. If I know I'm going to pay a part of that billion dollar judgment, I'm going to think I'm going to, instead of shooting first and asking questions seconds, I'm going to do it the other way around. So make the cops personally liable. Number six, I got this app that I tell all young black men to get on their phone. It's by the ACLU. It's an app that allows you to audio tape and videotape all encounters with police. And a part of that I tell people to agitate and demand that police wear body cameras. But I'm not naive. The killing of Eric Garner was videotaped right there for all the world to see. And you can't say cameras are going to be a be all and end all, but my thing is, I always tell people, I don't go to court to get justice. I go to court as a lawyer to expose the injustice. Right, right. So even if those cameras are not used in court to penalize these cops, at least the public can see it. And number seven, as a lawyer, I can't tell people to engage in what we lawyers call nullification. Nullification means that, hey, this guy might have had some weed, but the cop was harassing him. And I don't like the fact that the cop was harassing him and arrested this black kid for weed possession, so I'm just going to find the kid not guilty, even though he had the weed. As a lawyer, I can't tell you to do that because I, as a lawyer, I swore to uphold the laws and the laws say you can't tell people to ignore the laws. That's all I say about that, let me move on. Um, number eight, um, vote out police condoning 
judges and legislators. Just go to the ballot box, find out who's supporting bad cops, get them out. Number nine, create and support, and this is really important, youth-led anti-police brutality organizations. And finally, because I've already taken up enough time, um, as part of the attack group, we have something called F the Police. And F the Police doesn't stand for what you think it stands for, or maybe it does. But in our case, F the Police stands for Film the Police. And it shows you how to legally record every encounter with police. Because as I said at the very beginning, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's nobody in here that has never had a bad encounter with a cop or who doesn't have a family member who had a bad encounter with a cop. And when the cops move in on you, you literally feel helpless. Like there's nothing you can do right there on the scene. You can't fight back because it's going to be worse. And you figure, OK, I'll get a lawyer and sue. But then the court system is designed to support the police. So the answer is we need to come to events like this and support NAN when it organizes initiatives like this. Thank you very much. And my name is Reverend Gregory Holston, a pastor of New Vision United Methodist Church on Broad and Westmoreland Streets and a, uh, and a member of POWER. POWER is Philadelphians organized to witness and power rebuild 40 houses of faith representing about 35,000 people across the city of Philadelphia, diverse Jewish, uh, Islamic, and Christian across the city of Philadelphia dedicated to building a city of opportunity that works for all. Um, there's so many of the points that the, uh, the attorney court just made is, is right on point. Um, and so the, I, I want to just touch on a little bit of the history and then touch on some of the points that are in, in this report and, and just kind of give you the, what we are saying is our recommendations of where we go forward. Um, I, many of you are already aware this this long history. This report does not really touch on the historical history of the Philadelphia Police Department. Uh, it really, they, when we had briefings with the people who wrote this report, they admitted we only have a really a narrow issue here that we're looking at. We didn't really talk about this long, systemic, institutionalized type of terrorist and oppression that's occurred. And I, use, I don't use the word terrorism lightly. Uh, if you ever had a Philadelphia police officer pull up mm. behind you mm. at 12 o'clock at night mm. and you were afraid, that's called terror. Mm. And if it's sponsored by the state, it's called state-sponsored mm. terrorism. Mm. You know, so many times we don't, we allow those words to be used by international people and not really take those words on for ourselves, but that's the kind of thing that went on uh, and continues to go on in our city. Uh, as was already noted, we were the first police commissioner to the, and deputy commissioner and top level commissioners in 1981 to actually be indicted. Mm. Uh, we also were one of the first to ever have uh, Amnesty International and the Human Rights Watch cite us for human rights violations. That means people outside mm. of the country mm. come and look at Philadelphia and say you're as bad as what's going on in other wow. parts the oppressive parts wow. of the world. Oh. Sometimes you can't see yourself until other people come mm -hmm. in and put a mirror up to you so you can see what is really going on and the kinds of things that we are used to that are really the rest of the world saying is you don't have to uh, take and you don't have to submit yourself to. Um, everyone also knows about uh, 20 years ago the 39th police district, the police officers who were buying it and selling cases and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and really uh, 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 coercing witnesses and beating up uh, clients and taking money and all kinds of this really, uh, as, as someone say, uh, a, a training day was going on at the 39th Police District. Uh, and then now even today, we have a training day type police situation that's going on in the courts right now where they're being prosecuted by federal prosecutors mm -hmm the same kind of mentality that goes on. And so this history has been long. You only have to pull up that we are the only town that has ever had 61 homes bombed by the police department. Uh, still an amazing thing that, that even 30 years after it happened, I still am in amazed when I look at the pictures that that kind of thing went on in the town that I love. Uh, 
So, so this history of institution, we're not saying every police officer is bad. We're not saying that, that some don't risk their lives, like the hero that was right in 25th Police District, right near my church, yes. risked his life in such a dramatic way and gave his life in such a dramatic way. We're clearly not saying every police officer is wrong or bad. What we're saying is the institution itself it's, it's rough with racism through and through right. that even good police officers can end up doing racist acts by simply following the patterns that have been called for by their supervisors and by the institution as a whole. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's, that's what we're saying. Even good police officers can do things that are wrong because the institution is pushing them to do it. Uh, now, now how, 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 does, how does that work in this report? This report takes the use of force. But before the use of force, there's another report that was done by the ACLU on stop and frisk. Yes. So if you put those two reports together and over top of it, that you put the President's Task Force report, you see from the time that a police officer meets an individual on the street till the time that person is arrested, Till that time that person may be shot and killed mm -hmm. throughout the entire process, the numbers indicate uh, unconstitutional behavior, unlawful arrests, unlawful stops, not improper use of procedures, improper use of policies, uh, not properly trained, not properly monitored. Uh, throughout the entire process, you see not just mistake after mistake, but oppression after oppression mm -hmm. from every action of the police officer until the time you were either in jail or you lay on the ground dead. Mm -hmm. Now, now, that's a challenge. And I've challenged the commissioner and I challenge all those who are good <coughs> police officers and want to see a strong police force. If you are from the very beginning following unconstitutional and unlawful procedures and policies and, and processes, then you have a whole systemic problem with your police department, not just one bad, two are bad apples, but a systemic problem that needs even further look at. And I, I would say that one of the things that power is beginning to look at in dressing these, all these reports together is that this report is not a Ferguson style report. That's right. The Ferguson style report looked at the whole police department and really said if you don't make systemic change, we're going to sue you to end you. Mm. After all of these years of this kind of behavior and procedures and processes in the Philadelphia Police Department, it's clear that we really need something more comprehensive than just this report. We <laughs> the history dictates it, the present dictates it, the, the policies and procedures listed here dictate a thorough review, a Ferguson type review, would, would probably, if you do that, at the end of it, you're going to have a Ferguson type recommendation of either complete transformation, take over by the Department of Justice, or eventually, let's, let's just let's destroy the whole thing and start all over again. That's right. And, 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 yeah, and I don't take any of those words lightly. I mean, I'm just looking at the history and the context of all of what we've been talking about for years. If this was just this, if it was just this problem, just right now, over the last several years, I'd say, okay, we could fix this. But with this long history also involved with this process that's been set up for tens of uh, tens and tens of years, you know that that fixing this is like fixing the chairs on a Titanic. Well, yeah, you're still going. To, you're still going down. That's right. still going. You're still going down. And so, so I, I don't want to denigrate the work here because it's excellent work, but it's limited in their scope, and we need to go deeper. So, so, so when it says, and I just want to bring up two points in the report, and then I'm going to let, let uh, Brother Anderson have his opportunity to share. Um, that struck me first of all was on the use of force. They, they, uh, the police officers were not sure what the standard was for the use of force. Now, I get this. You're using force, but you're unclear what the standard is for when you're supposed to use it. 
you know, uh, that, that, that is a major, that's not the, the little problem. That's like a, a doctor going into the hospital room to do surgery and is unfamiliar with the instruments that they're going to use to cut your body open. I mean, it, 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 it is shocking that somehow they would not be clear on what the policy is or the, and the policy as written was not exactly what the case law and the uh, Supreme Court said the law was to be followed. What, 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 what's the problem here? They are making their decisions based on whether they are afraid. Right. Now, now, now I, the standard is not a subjective standard of whether you're afraid and therefore I got to shoot you. Police officers take a job knowing that they're going to be afraid at times. They, they, because it's, it's a difficult job. They cannot shoot everybody every time they're afraid or they will be walking out the door shooting all the time. Can't, you can't base it on that. You got to base it on a, what a reasonable police officer would have to fear in that particular situation. It's not a subjective standard of what they feel. It's a standard based on training and study of what these points happen. And when they happen, I have a reason objectively to fear. Mm -hmm. See, they, they weren't even following that. They weren't even comprehending that. And so through the entire process, they carried that on. And so this, uh, the other part of that is they didn't have a standard of, 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 of knowing how to de-escalate the situation. They weren't trained to do that. And they didn't know the standard of uh, what's the next step up of, of use of force. Meaning they, they first would stop you, and then they would stop you. If they had a physical confrontation with you, they could use physical confrontation, but they didn't have pepper spray, and they don't have uh, stun guns. They're not equipped with them, nor are they trained how to use them, which is the next step layer that you're supposed to do before you use lethal fo force. Right. Mm -hmm. So on the, on the Brandon Tate Brown case that just happened, right. they didn't have any pepper spray or stun guns from what we can determine. If they had it and they knew how to use it and were properly trained, maybe they would have stunned him and he'd be alive today. Right, right, right. Whatever the circumstances surrounding or what the fight was and how it happened and all of that, maybe he still would have been alive even if he was dead wrong. That maybe he would still be alive if there just was a process of following and they had the proper equipment to be able to do. Right, right. So I, I'm looking on those two things first as, so, as wrong in the process, and then finally the, uh, the need for an independent police advisory board is so clear. Mm -hmm. We don't have trust in the process after the shooting has occurred. We do not believe what the police are telling us. They can talk and talk and talk, and we're still going to have doubt or believe in anything they have to say because of this long history. And there's nothing that Commissioner Ramsey or anybody can do that can take that collective history away from us so that somehow we don't remember what has happened in the past. The only way, there's no way they can ever win the trust. I always was told also by my mother that if, if you want to, if you want to build something, it takes a while. But if you want to tear something down, you can tear it down in the night. So the point is, if you tear down trust, it takes years to rebuild the trust you may have torn down in one day. We got 50 years of trust being torn down between the police and the community. How long do you think it's really going to take before them ever to rebuild that trust again? So they're not, going to have, they're not going to be able to do it. What's necessary is an independent police review board who will be on the ground as soon as that incident happens. As soon as there is a shooting, that they will be given knowledge of it and get on the ground and do a parallel investigation exactly. of everything that happens so that the community can know for sure that the, everything, every stone has been uncovered, every situation has been looked at, and so that the truth can be clearly told and we can believe in the process again. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Kelvin Anderson. I'm the Executive Director of the Police Advisory Commission. It's always a pleasure to sit with these folks and talk about uh, something that's very important to our community. Um, You've heard a lot about the history of uh, this problem here in Philadelphia, and certainly 
Uh, it goes back for many, many years, as, as you've heard from everyone. Uh, our own involvement, in particular with shootings by the department, dates back to roughly the same time uh, that Vivian and the NAN folks got involved with this particular issue. In 2007 and 2008, we noticed an increase in the number of uh, citizens shot by police officers. At the same time, we also had a number of officers who were being shot then, uh, pretty, pretty tense during those years. We received at that point um, complaints and communications from 10 different families who were involved in officer-involved shootings. Uh, we attempted to deal with those on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, in some instances, the police department, as they have uh, recently in the Brandon Tate Brown uh, incident, would uh, sit down with the family, share something with them from the investigation. Maybe it was a report, uh, perhaps a video in some instances, but there was no consistent way of dealing with these incidents. There was no consistent discussion of what exactly the investigation shows, what was the conclusion of the Firearms Review Board, what did the DA say. So in 2013, one of the first things I did is when I became executive director was to write to Commissioner Ramsey and demand that all of those files from 2007 to present be released and that we establish a procedure for our agency to receive those uh, incidents and those reports ongoing. Uh, we felt very strongly that all of the details of those shootings should be made public, as they are, frankly, in other jurisdictions around the country. If you go to other cities, they don't have this issue, at least to the extent that we do. Uh, those, those cities will tell you what the, what the reports say. They'll make the entire report public. In Las Vegas, for example, where they conducted uh, a similar collaborative mm -hmm. reform review before this one in 2010, if you go there, they actually have a hearing after the shooting where the officer who does the shooting testified, the witnesses are there, the entire report is made public. That's the kind of transparency we're looking to establish here in Philadelphia. Uh, one of the things I'm doing right now with our council is we're working on an uh, agreement with this city and the law department for us to receive those files. It looks like that that will happen fairly soon. Um, I want to focus mostly, since you've heard very much about the history of how we got here, I want to focus on where we're going to go from here now. Uh, what we're going to do when we get those files, and that's going to be over the next couple months or so, is go through each and every one of these cases and try to provide as much public um, documentation of those as we can. Um, as you know, Commissioner Ramsey and the department has been very much against releasing the names of officers involved in these incidents. We don't believe that that uh, decision will stand. Frankly, we don't believe it's his decision to make. Uh, this is something that we as a community need to make that, and we need to pressure uh, the commissioner and uh, the elected officials to make certain that that transparency is, is dealt with properly. And there's a lot of uh, discussion of that issue of lack of transparency and the distrust that it creates uh, in this report. Uh, one of the other things I, I want you to note is that the voice, uh, the voices that come out in this report that are telling us what is wrong with the department is, is often from officers themselves. And everything that, uh, that Reverend Holcomb just mentioned around the officer-involved shootings from the training that they receive at the academy to the in-service training they receive while they're officers to any type of advanced training. All the problems with those uh, issues came to, or in this report, from the voices of officers. Officers know that there's a problem with the way that they're trained. They know that they're not, they're receiving inconsistent instructions on how to use deadly force. So to that end, uh, one of the other things that we want to make certain to do is that Officers who do step forward and report misconduct or who report problems from within the department need to be protected and we need to be able to listen to them and support them. You know what happens to them now? They're the ones who get cheese put in their lockers and all sorts of other nonsense that happens to officers who attempt to report misconduct. So I think we want to be very clear that we also need to listen to those officers and support them when they're bringing these problems forward. Uh, fortunately, this report uh, is a big official report with researchers and stuff, and they're telling us that uh, they're t the officers are telling us the problems they're having through 
um, the lens of, of this particular research uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. But we need to support those individual officers in those cases, and we're going to be identifying who they are and working to do that as well. Um, so I, I think that's a very critical part of this. Another thing that we're going to need to hear more of your voices from is the policy formulations. One of the big things also in the President's Task Force report that the Commissioner and the Mayor have said they're going to put all of these uh, recommendations into play is that when we have a significant policy change, like for example now we have body cameras coming into the department. Uh, many of us are looking forward to see exactly how that plays out. How is that going to change our, uh, the way we do misconduct investigations? Is it going to give us enough information in some instances to actually sustain, sustain complaints in instances where we can't sustain complaints now because all we have is a word of an officer versus uh, uh, a citizen? So we really want to see how that plays out. But one very important point in the task force report is that a police department should form policy with the community mm -hmm. at the table. They shouldn't be forming a policy and then just simply delivering it to us. You and I need to be at the table when the commissioner and the folks in the department are forming the policies on how those body cameras work. Another thing we've just heard about, uh, Council President Clark just talked about shot spotter technology, possibly useful technology, but again, we need to be at the table as they put together the rules on how this technology operates. So that's something that we're going to be coming to you a lot more in the, in the years coming as the department tries to form this policy. We're going to want to hear from you on how this is going to affect you and your neighborhoods. We're going to want to bring other groups, the ACLU, other folks to the table as we consider how these changes in the police department are going to affect our community. Th these, are, these are our rules as much as they are the police department's rules. And that's something that I really want to stress a lot. Thank you. From the eye. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I may disagree with Mike just a little bit. I, I do think the DA can solve this police problem. I like Mr. Anderson, but I really don't think we need a police review board. We need a DA that's going to lock these folks up. They're going to apply the same law to the police as we apply to everyday citizens. The only reason why we need a police review board is because the DA is not doing his job. Okay? So, and I, and I do think as, a, um, by the way, I'm voting for Tracy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I think we have, as a community, I think we've been going the wrong way of dealing with these things. Uh, I think it's the difference between identifying a problem and a symptom. A lot of what we think are problems are really simple. You know, it's and the thing that we don't think a problem are really problems. And how do you tell the difference? Uh, I'll tell you how you tell. If you eliminate a symptom, you still got a problem. But if you eliminate a problem, all the symptoms will go away. In other words, we have some of the worst things in our community, like police abuse. Murderous cops roaming our streets. As bad as it is, it's a symptom. Uh, poor, run-down, raggedy schools in our areas, in our community, are symptoms. Um, our lack of economic control in our own community, uh, the crime and the drugs in general, our lack of political uh, influence over what happens in these elections. A symptom. What's the problem? I think instinctively we all know what the problem is. When I go out and I speak to places in our community, I ask two questions. I know what the answer is going to be. The first question is, uh, can we as a community solve these problems if we cooperate with each other? If we learn to trust each other, 
Can we solve these problems? Everybody say yes. Sure. Yeah. It's not rocket science. Right. Then I ask the question, are we ever going to cooperate with each other? Are we ever going to learn to trust each other and communicate with our neighbors and our families in our collective interest? What's the answer? No. Most people will tell you no. We're never going to do that. So that's why we're in this rut that we're in right now. Um, I think that, you know, when I was, uh, when I was young, uh, with this bully in school, and he would always go around and say, give me your lunch or else. And everybody would just turn it over to him. And then one day, some, a new guy came in. He wasn't hearing that. The bully said, give me your lunch or else. And he said, or oh, else what? <laughs> the bully said, or oh, else you don't give it to me. <laughs> you know, and I think that's where we are politically. That's where we are. You know, we got a mayor's election coming up next, next month, right? Mm -hmm. Who picks the police commission? The mayor. The mayor. You know I mean, that's not rocket science. Not rocket that, again, but you have to learn how to cooperate, cooperate with each other mm -hmm. to do that. But African Americans uh, are the majority in the Democratic Party, yeah. right? right? Democrats outnumber Republicans in this town seven to one, right? Yes. I mean, it's clear what we should be doing. And, and 2017 is the DA's race. We have a DA in his dysfunction, you know? The cops are unfair to him. He had to go to a uh, police officer, Faulkner's wife, to ask the wife, can he uh, go to, should he go to Supreme Court and appeal the Munier rule, you know? He does not represent us. We need somebody in there who does, okay? I think basically uh, it's the citizens who are at the heart of the solution in this city, and probably in the whole country. You know, cops always try to make it seem like they're, they're so smart, we solved this mystery, we solved that one. But if you look at, in every case, and especially in major cases where crime has been solved, it's the citizens. They tell the police, the police, the, they don't know, they don't live in the community. So they come in and answer, who did it? Right? If the, the citizen is going to point out the perpetrator, going to even go to court to testify and risk his or her life doing so. It's really the citizen is the solution to this problem. And really, and I may sound crazy, but we need to eliminate most police. You don't need them. If I had a problem in my community, I certainly would rather for the brothers to come out and help me out rather than calling some outside force right. that, do, that don't like me, you know? And in reality, if we organize and learn how to watch each other's back, watch each other's houses, take notes, go to court, demand justice, we could solve this problem. And now, once in a while, you're going to have to have a few cops come in. But it should be cops who we put in place, okay. who we trust, not some outsiders with some gripe or some grudge against our people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we could solve this problem. And I'm just waiting for people to tell me the other answer when I ask that question next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to hear lastly from Attorney Vivian Crawford, and then we're going to hear from you. There, there are a couple things because you heard from me earlier, but there are a couple things that I heard, and I'd like, I'd like us to to deal with. I'd like to ask the panel about. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that, as to my understanding, this report was issued on the twenty. 4th of March. of March, and to date, this is April 2nd, there's only been one mayoral candidate who has said that he would follow the recommendations of the Department of Justice. 
Now, th that's very important for you to understand because I, I'm somebody that, in terms of the mayoral race, I didn't, felt, I didn't feel like I actually had a dog in that race until this report came out and there was only one candidate who said that he would be willing to follow the recommendations. Now, I'm not telling you how to vote, but I'm asking you to be aware because that's very important. The police, this is, this is something that's an issue. And this is not a panacea. You are exactly right. This doesn't cover the breadth of what's going on. But when, I, when we have a mayoral race going on, and people are spending dollars on television to advertise, and you get one mayoral candidate that says that he supports the police, <coughs> fraternal order of police, and is not interested in this, and then you have one that's silent because uh, the history of that particular candidate was to pursue having Mumia executed. And then, you know, you start talking about the death sentence, I have a problem with that. But anyway, so one candidate, we already know where that candidate stands because the pos position that was occupied by that candidate was simply that Mumia should be executed and that whatever the police say is right. And then you got another candidate that is saying that. Uh, I'm supported by the FOP, and therefore I am not going to pay attention to this. And you have another candidate that says that he will support these recommendations, which is a start. Then it seems very clear to me the kind of choices that we should be making. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is that for those of you who know me, I mean, I ran for judge twice. And uh, the first time I actually stood up uh, at a meeting and challenged the audience because I didn't understand and couldn't understand why every time we show up at an event, as soon as the event, you know, everybody would get there and, you know, you queue up in terms of when you, when you arrive. And, and let me say this, Lynn Abraham is somebody that personally, you know, I like and we, we, I see her and we, hi, how you doing with buddies, from that respect. But whenever Lynn would walk into the room, they would, everybody else would be pushed to the side and they were anxious to have her speak. So I actually stood up at a church, and because my history is in the civil rights movement, I was a kid marching at Gerard, as I already told you, and you, so you got some idea about how old I must be. But the reality is that I felt that we had someone who was running for office who looked more like me than Lynn Abraham looked like me, and I, didn't, I couldn't get why folk were not supporting him, and I literally said, Cecil would be turning in his grave to think that we're even having this as a conversation. Now, that being said, I like Seth, and when I see him high, but Seth has been a disappointment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seth has been a disappointment. Yeah. And so yeah. then I stopped and realized, well, you know, when he was running, the FOP was supporting him against Lynn. I don't know what that tells you, but it should tell you something. So I am always calling things like I see him, so we have a lot of elected officials, a lot of black folk that come around when they want to get elected to an office and we vote for them. And Paul, you know, I said this earlier when we were talking about Cecil's event, we got a lot of Negroes suffering from the delusion of inclusion. Okay, so think about that. Because they get into an elected position and the first thing that they do is they want to assure everybody else that these people are my color, but they ain't my kind. Mm -hmm. So I'm just telling you, Seth has been a disappointment. I have sat in his office and complained about various things, and he, yes, Vivian, and now that you know, he does that, but nothing ever happens. So I want us to, when we are talking about voting for candidates, we have to look at what does that candidate stand for and what does that mean to my community. Exactly. Yes. Okay? Because I don't care what color the candidate is. If they are going, and I will say to you, all I want is a fair hearing. I'm not asking you to give me a favor. I'm just asking for a fair hearing. Right. And I have been in front of some judges who have despicable records, despicable, when it comes to our community. Because when a police officer comes in and puts his hand on the Bible and swears to tell what you, and lies, and lies, they sit right there like it's okay. So I'm simply suggesting to you that you've heard some things. I really do want you to, we've got an election coming up, we've got some candidates in the room, but we need to make certain that when we are voting for judges, we are voting for judges. You don't have to give me a break, but what you do have to do is you have to be fair and you have to administer justice. Right. 
Okay, so that that the money so fast. And I, I'm not even going to say that. Okay. Now we want to hear from you, uh, the community, regarding the recommendations, regarding what you heard from our esteemed panel. A lot of information I know, a lot of information taken. I hope you were taking notes like, well, like I have been taking notes. But we want to hear from you. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Rafael. I'm still Rafael. digesting and you know, processing. Yeah. I think I'm learning, I'm becoming a young activist, but it just upsets me when I hear about that whole like DOJ in terms of it's just a farce to pacify us because uh, the young man was saying that you know, we get together as a community and do this and do this, but I know low income white communities they don't have to do this. And they're, they're not being shot, they're not being killed or harassed. So I don't, I'm not saying it's respectability politics. I'm just saying I'm just tired of hearing, you know, the blame being put on the community. And then also, I don't like the terms of us putting so much faith in these politicians. Obama's a Democrat. You know, he was in Sandy Hook in two days, but he took forever. I don't think he ever made it down to Ferguson. So it's like, you know, I might be more radical in approach of like revolution, not like maybe in terms of like a French revolution. <laughs> and I know it's young and older, and, you know, bloodshed and like that type of mentality is like, okay, we want to back away from that. But I think my Andrew said, you know, when someone shows you who they are, believe them, and society has shown us who they are again and again. Voting is an illusion. If it changed anything, um, we wouldn't be where we are now. We would never have a, a room of white parents having this discussion, because they would be outraged, and those police would be dismantled and disarmed right away. Right. America, society does not care about black people, and the moment we, we know about that, but we allow these little, th this whole report is like a stumbling block. It's to like appease us, okay, they care about us, let's see how we can dismantle it, let's see how we can like focus on recommendations, and that's just like, while we're doing this, they're making more, you know, um, passing laws, and Congress to suppress us, oppress us more and more and more. And I'm not saying, you know, not woke, I'm just saying we gotta make noise because I'm not like singling out any politicians. What about, here. not to cut you off, Raphael, okay. but what about the report? What is oh, your, okay. what is your opinion of the My report, report based on what you why, I'm sorry, I don't know why we have a report. It, it, we shouldn't need one. It's like, it's, it's blatant. It's, it's been like, I think people touched on already. It's society, it's, it's in the Constitution in terms of like, these police officers don't have a problem with force because they don't use this force on these white kids who spare their face. I, you know, I'm in Penn State, my best friend is white, Kensington, Fort Richmond, Mayfair, all these white communities where these white kids, white adults, get five DUIs, get slapped on the wrist. So for them to say, oh, these police officers don't know how to use force, it's a lie. They do know how to, it's just it's race, but no one wants to deal with, no political candidate wants to deal with that. And unfortunately, that's like ingrained in our society, and it's not going to. Results in anything, but that's the issue. Thank, thank, you. Yeah, go, go thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. One of our panelists is going to respond to you. Then we're going to hear from Okang. And okay. I think okay. one of the I think one of the values of a report like this is the level of detail. And and I want to address one of the things you just said about race. Um, if you take a look, uh, one of the charts in here uh, deals with unarmed shootings and race. Actually, half of the people that the Philadelphia Police Department shot who were unarmed were white. So it's not exactly true that white folks aren't being shot and aren't you know, victims of this as well. And frankly, if you look around the country, we've got 18,000 police departments in this country. And in fact, even with the very poor knowledge we have nationally about how many people are actually shot by police, and I'll give you that, we really don't know. There are plenty of white folks around this country who are shot by police, but they simply don't complain the way we do, quite honestly. So, well, my, my point is, I think we don't, we really want to take the details of something like this and figure out how we can improve what we're doing here in Philadelphia. And I expect people around the country and other communities to do the same thing. So. I that's what I'm saying, but the reality is and experience is I understand that white people might get shot and get killed as well. However, universally, as a whole, collectively, historically, which is still present as of today, white kids, white male, white female are not being killed. This report, like I said, is a farce. It's just to pacify us. 
ones, it's not, you know, you're both, you're, you're distracted, it's a distracting tool. Oh, well, why you get shot too? Okay, me too. Yeah. <laughs> that, but, you know, they're not being oppressed in ways systematically that we are to this day. So that's, the, that's my concern.